Welcome to Soundscapes. My name is Gregor Zubicki. I am the artistic manager of the Swedish Chamber Orchestra and it is my great pleasure to be your host. Today, amongst other things, we're meeting the cellist Stephen Isselis and talking with him about Schumann. Welcome. Hello and welcome to Soundscapes, the second of our programs. And uh, in a little while we'll be talking with Stephen Isselis, the wonderful cellist, about the composer Schumann, his relationship to Schumann, and of course the cello concerto in particular. But before we do that, I thought I would like to tell you a little, about, a little bit about the story of the Swedish Chamber Orchestra. Because after all, uh, this is our program and it's about the orchestra and, and our friendships. And I think the history of every orchestra is quite interesting. How does an orchestra come about? I mean, some orchestras, of course, are old. We have these really old orchestras who often started like the Staatskapelle Dresden or Hofkapelle in Stockholm, the opera orchestra. Many of these are actually opera orchestras that started off as a small capelle, maybe a small group of players um, who... Um, who started maybe five, six players, and it grew and grew in the royal court until it became uh, an orchestra. Um, then, of course, you have modern orchestras that were founded um, maybe 110 years ago, a lot of the big symphony orchestras. And in recent times, chamber orchestras. And each orchestra has its own history, um, and many of them are what I call generational orchestras. It is to say, players of a certain age who came together and played together, maybe did some chamber music concerts and said, hey, we would like to form an orchestra. We would like to be an orchestra on our own terms. Because the great thing with a chamber orchestra is it's, because of its smaller size, it allows the musicians to have a greater influence, to, have, to in a way, form their life much more. Some chamber orchestras don't even have conductors. They play with their leader or with guest leaders, and, and so forth. This orchestra had a very specific history here in Örebro. Now, Örebro is a small, middle-sized Swedish city, small in European terms, mid-sized in Swedish terms, about 150,000 people, a university, a castle, a river, a really lovely town. And about 80 years ago, in the early 1930s, one decided to build a concert hall here in Örebro. This was not an entire coincidence, because at the same time, concert halls were built in Gothenburg and Stockholm, which were the two, and are still the two big cities in Sweden. And they built their concert halls there, that was because they had orchestras that needed a hall. That Örebro built a hall at that time was not really something that was on the cards. They did it simply because Örebro, even as a much, much smaller place then, had a feeling of, we also want to be a city to be reckoned with. And it's through a culture, it's through the culture that a city, that a community creates, that we say something about who we are. The ancient cave art says something about that community. We may not know anything about them, but we know that they were a community that had sufficient energy and, and confidence to document what they were thinking and doing in art. And so it was with the concert hall here. And without this concert hall, the Swedish Chamber Orchestra would never have existed. But the specific things that led to the Swedish Chamber Orchestra were in the early 90s, 93, 94, 95. In 1995, there was a crisis here in Örebro. There were three ensembles. There was a string orchestra financed by the city. There was a wind orchestra which had survived from the military in, in an evolved and which was financed by uh, government money. And then there was even an Örebro Symphony Orchestra where these two orchestras were joined and players were brought in from Stockholm, Stockholm, in case you didn't know, is two hours due east from here. So, and all these three orchestras were financed from different sectors, and there was not enough money really to do any of them properly. And there was a real crisis. Everything was about to collapse, and people, the musicians, were not really communicating well with each other, uh, the way things are in a crisis. And at that point, there was a Norwegian here, Knut Hirkesete, who was tasked with do something, do something. So he took this whole group of people, 35 people, to um, sort of a, 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 a small house somewhere in, in, where, you could have, where you could have conferences, and he brought them all together in a room over a weekend, and he said, he told them a story. He said, look, here's a Swedish chamber orchestra. They've just had a successful debut at the proms. They're packing the instruments together. They're called the Swedish chamber orchestra, and that's you. And the room was quiet. And when they left, 
the conference center there, two days later, they'd made the decision to call themselves a Swedish chamber orchestra and to play at the proms in 10 years' time. Of course, the proms is a very defining orchestra festival, and to get there is a long journey, and at that point, no Swedish orchestra had actually played at the proms. So for this little provincial group to call themselves a Swedish chamber orchestra and to, and to have the gumption to say, we're going to do this, uh, was, was regarded as, as almost... Uh, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, something uh, Großheitswahnsinn, one would say in, in German. The English word right now escapes me. Uh, hubris, and a moment of extreme hubris. I was still living in Norway at the time. I was an oboist with the Bergen Philharmonic Orchestra, and, and um, uh, friends of mine from Stockholm called me, said, have you heard the, the guys in Odebrue are calling themselves the Swedish Chamber Orchestra? And I thought, well, who knows? And um, about a year later, I was called and asked if I was interested in this job as being artistic manager of this group. And they were interested, and they had already engaged as their music director, Thomas Dausgaard, who I knew of as a young and very, very promising Danish conductor. So I figured these people, they had an idea. Maybe this could be something. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I got the job, and I, and I meet with Thomas Dausgaard. And he says to me, I would like to record all the Beethoven symphonies. Now, recording the Beethoven symphonies was something that simply no Swedish orchestra had done before. In fact, I would go so far as to say no Scandinavian orchestra had recorded Beethoven symphonies. Because we didn't do that. That was done by ensembles in Europe, in Germany, Munich, whatever. We recorded Swedish, Scandinavian, contemporary music. So just as simply the idea that a Swedish orchestra and a chamber orchestra to boot, because at that time, very, very few chamber orchestras were playing Beethoven symphonies. So it was a radical idea. And, uh, and I said to him, well, wouldn't it be a good idea that we become a good orchestra first and then we record the Beethoven symphonies, which I thought was a talented idea. But he says, no, we will become a good orchestra by recording the Beethoven symphonies. So the process, in a way, became the whole thing. And at that time, the new Jonathan Del Mar edition was just becoming slowly available. In fact, Thomas Dowsgood knew Jonathan, so we were able to get his notes before they were even published and transfer them into our music with pencil. And, and the first recordings were made, and, um, and they were a success. And we actually did play at the proms only eight years after the formation of the orchestra. But that whole story is another story, and I'll take that at another time in another program, because if I use all my material now, what's the point of making another show? Anyway, that's what I wanted to talk about this morning. And, or is it this afternoon? I lose track of time. Anyway, I'll leave the rest of the story for another day. Now it's time to meet our guest this afternoon, Stephen Isselis. Welcome, Stephen. Well, Stephen, welcome to Soundscapes. Sound Soundscape. It's a very nice name. We're quite proud of it. And it's only the second Soundscape. <laughs> so, you know, there, there's room for improvement. <laughs> yes. You have me on, there's definitely room we're, for we're, improvement. Well, we're working on it, you know, building it up as it goes. Mm. Anyway, you're here and you're going to play Schumann with us, Schumann Cello Concerto. That's the plan. And Schumann is quite a favourite composer of yours. He definitely is, yes. And why is that? Because he's a complete genius and well, he's got everything, really. I mean, he's the most touching man as a man and you feel it through his music. And he's a complete master. I mean, the rhythmic imagination, for instance, in the cello concerto, is astonishing if you actually look at what he's doing. He's a complete master of everything, and he's got such imagination. And also for me, he's sort of, I guess he fires me up partly because he's sort of an underdog. Of course, he's a very famous composer, but actually probably less than a third of his music is actually heard regularly in concert halls. And I think that's so unfair. People say he went off as he got older. I don't think so at all. I think his late works are perhaps his greatest. And some they were destroyed, weren't they? Well, the romances for cello were destroyed, yes. Yeah. That was a great tragedy. That's our biggest tragedy, I think, us cellists. Yeah, losing something like that. Because they survived for 40 years and then Clara decided they weren't good enough and burned them. She was a pyromaniac. <laughs> Did he write anything else for cello specifically? Yes. Apart from the concerto, which yeah, of is? Of course, he wrote the pieces in folk style. Oh, that's right. 1849. And he also sort of said it was okay to play the Adagio in Allegra and the fantasy pieces for clarinet. He said they were both sort of authorized for cello by him. Well, I think one of the interesting things about all of those pieces is that 
they all tend to work quite well on other instruments. Not, they don't feel so specific. No, they don't. They don't. No. They only work on cello. No. Just, they only work on cello. And Even if they weren't originally written for cello, they only work on cello. I and, think and, that's scientifically proven. That's your, that's your expert opinion? <laughs> yes. Oh, good. Well, I mean, it's always good to get that clear, mm. you know. Follows. Uh, but well, no, I don't think the cello concerto works well on other instruments. I know there's a violin version. I think it's a mistake. I even heard a viola version. Yeah, I'm sorry. Everybody has to suffer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, it's, this is true. Mm. Um, no, but it's interesting also because the symphonies, he, he has this reputation of not being a good orchestrator. <sighs> it's such a cliche. Yeah. It's like a sheep in a field. It goes, bah! And then another sheep hears that and goes, bah! And then and before long, they're all going, bah, bah, bah. And that's why if somebody says Schumann was a bad orchestrator, the next person says, yes, he was a bad orchestrator. And then, you know, it's not based in fact. He's a wonderful orchestrator. And, and this Post cello concerto is a great example. It's perfect. Shostakovich tried to reorchestrate it and deeply regretted it. Really? I didn't know that. Well, Mahler reorchestrated the symphonies. Yes, but he was working with very different instruments. I mean, yeah. That was before they started looking at what sh the instruments Schum for which Schumann was actually writing. And, you know, you can't judge a composer for if it's already an arrangement. I mean, yeah. now, of course, we're still playing modern instruments, but we know the sound world he lived in. And it makes a difference. Yeah, and the chamber orchestra as a size mm. has the yeah, right yeah, balance. Yeah, he had 40, 42 people in his orchestra in Dusseldorf. It was a small orchestra. Yeah, as it was for Brahms. Mm. Mining them. With the whole, um, and of course their relationship was also an interesting... Yeah, it's a wonderful relationship. Brahms, even though Brahms did fall in love with his wife, with Schumann's wife, but still that was such torture for Brahms, it burned him for life. He was still very, very loyal to Schumann. He was wonderful to Schumann. Yeah. And Schumann was wonderful to him. But they only actually knew each other for four months, really. Before really? Schumann. Yeah. They met on October the 1st, 1853, and in February 1854, Schumann, at the end of February, Schumann was taken to the asylum. So, and after that, they saw each other a few times because Brahms was one of the very few people who visited Schumann in the asylum. But I mean, only a couple of times, maybe three times. And um, so it's a very short friendship. I had no idea it was one. so brief because one always one always reads about this when they meet and he writes about Brahms in yeah. his in his newspaper or in magazine. Yeah, Brahms, a genius. That's right. And then yes, then he wrote the big article. Yeah. And it's interesting to think that he he had this magazine for new music, yes. which you know. It's Zeitschrift. Well, by then he hadn't been editing it for a long time. It has sort of actually turned against him in a way. Um, but yes, he wrote this big article, which put huge pressure on Brahms. I mean, we you know it's a famous fact that Schumann wrote this great article predicting Brahms' amazing future. But I think that put a lot of people off Brahms as well, because he's being praised suddenly to the skies, this young upstart, and yeah. poor Brahms. And it took him a long time until he dared write a symphony, which is what Schumann sort of dared him to do, or challenged him to do in this article. Yeah, to be sort of continue Beethoven's, Beethoven's world. Clara Schumann, did she ever write anything for the cello? No, but play? I do play her romances for violin on. The cello. Yeah, they also. And there's a cello solo in her piano concerto, although that's actually orchestrated by Schumann himself. I didn't but know that either. He, so he got involved See, in that. The there are things you don't know. Well, this is why I do this pod. Because right. now it's, you know everything. Well, I know a lot. <laughs> yeah, pretty close. It's 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 a good thing. Yeah. And of course, all the people watching yeah. as well. Of course, it has this all eight of them spin-off effect. Okay. <laughs> So often in a year when you play the Schumann Concerto? Quite a lot at the moment, because people have been keen on having smaller orchestras. So I played Schumann and Haydn a lot recently. But it's all right, I never get sick of either of them, actually. I love the Haydn Concertos as well, both of them. And Schumann is just, it's just a magical piece. It's the most, I'm not sure there is a more personal concerto for any instrument than the Schumann Cello Concerto including his own piano and violin concertos. It takes you so deep inside him. And concertos don't always do that. You know, they're more public pieces just yeah. by their nature. Beautiful and gorgeous though they are. And, you know, I mean, something like the Brahms D minor piano concerto is deeply personal, but it's still public somehow. Um, whereas the Schumann cello concerto takes you right deep inside his psyche, if you like, his soul. Um, in a, a unique way. I mean, that first movement, there's nothing like it in music. And it's so beautiful. As I said to the orchestra today, it's like some of the greatest love music ever written. <laughs> you can't think what to say to that. No, that's <laughs> good. For once, I've made you speechless. No, no, no but sometimes, sometimes you just say it and yeah, that's how it is. That's how it is.
And as I also said, you know, in 30 bars in the slow moment, he produces bliss, the bliss of love. It takes Wagner well over an hour in act two of Tristan. <laughs> <laughs> Schumann's much more environmentally sound. He doesn't waste energy. <laughs> it gets to the point. <laughs> yes, Tristan is always a long journey. It is. I know it's a work of genius, of course. It's just, but I'd rather have Schumann myself. Yeah. How much chamber music do you have time to play? It's not time, it's just opportunity, really. Yeah. Um, fair amount. I, I play quite a lot often with younger musicians, my own sort of young musicians I really like to play with. And then I've got my you know, circle of friends like Joshua Bell and Jeremy Denk and, um, and people I play chain music with um, the Wigmore Hall, for instance. And then, of course, I do lots of recitals. Yeah. Um, with various pianists. And, um, yeah, so I think everything is chain music to me. Concertos are chain music, too, and that's how we're trying to play the Schumann concerto yeah. as chamber music. Yeah, which, of course, you're quite right. You just mentioned that, um, that Schumann has been a, a useful piece during the pandemic. Uh, because yeah, because orchestras not, yeah. tend to downsize. In fact, we, we found that all the symphonic, symphony orchestras have tried to be chamber orchestras during yes, this time, yeah. which is, there's a certain irony there, I suppose. But uh, and, and after this pandemic is over, I, I've often had this question, what have we learned from the pandemic? Have we learned anything from the pandemic, do you think? That we should get vaccinated. Yes, that's as a good... As soon as we have the chance. <laughs> yes. Um, that's a good I don't know, I hope we've learned things. So it doesn't happen again in my lifetime. Yeah. And or sense, even yours. Or even mine, yes, it's true. Which, yeah, it's a question of... Yeah, somewhat fewer years. Yeah. Yes, but, but hopefully um, with, some, with some merit left in them. Yeah. Anyway, well, thank you, Stephen. Is that it? That's it. That's it. That, that sounds good. Tips. I can go and practice now. Yes, well, that's what, that was yeah, the idea sorry, that you yeah, would exactly. practice. Yeah, you were hoping. I was hoping because, you yeah, know, a lot, of, yeah. lot yeah. of suggestions. Yeah, All right. thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been wonderful to have you here and I hope we'll be seeing each other again and again.